Exodus chapter 20. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water underneath the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of our of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or your sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honour your father and mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbour. You shall not covet your neighbour's house. You shall not covet your neighbour's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbour's. Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled, and they stood far off and said to Moses, You speak to us, and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us, lest we die. Moses said to the people, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. The people stood far off, while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. Let's pray. Lord, in another week where we've seen violent atrocities that man carries out upon one another, pray, Lord, that you would step into the mess. Lord, be with the family of George Floyd. Be with our countries that are facing issues because of fear and racial injustice. Calm the wave of intolerance, Lord, that we have towards one another. Teach us, Lord, to be still, to know that you are God, that you are in control, and you are in the midst of all of this. Open our hearts and our minds to you, Lord, and to your word and to your commandments. Be, Lord, with the family of Madeline McCann as they've been clinging on to hope for so many years. Lord, be their comfort and be their strength at this moment as the investigation continues. Pray, Lord, that you would be with Mexico and Brazil as they reach the peak, Lord, of the COVID-19. And I pray, Lord, that many would come to know you as Lord and Saviour through this. But I also pray, Lord, that the numbers will decrease, that there will be a turn, Lord, in the COVID-19 situation over in Central and Southern America, Lord, that lives will be saved. Pray, Lord, for the UK and Irish governments, Lord, and as the economies begin to reopen. I pray, Lord, for those who are mourning loss of loved ones and who need your guidance, need your hand, need your protection, your love, need us to be your hands on this earth. Pray, Lord, for those who are still feeling lonely or 
anxious and are still isolating. Pray, Lord, that we will be your feet to meet their need. And I pray, Lord, that we will all come to terms, Lord, with the new normal, that this time has given us a chance to step back and to reevaluate. Lord, teach us through this time and teach us how to move forward as your people. As we look at your word today and your commandments, Lord, I pray for the protection, Lord, of families and of couples, Lord. Especially, Lord, after the coronavirus has unfortunately separated so many and kept kept others apart who are already separate, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would bring families together and you protect the stability of the family home. Lord, we've made a mess of things and we have eyes, Lord, that look to others, their property, their things. Lord, may our mind and our eyes be on you. May we not be the haves or the have-nots. May we learn radical generosity, Lord. May we share and care. Lord, give us ears, Lord, to hear what you have to say to us through your word this morning. And pray it, Lord, in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Hey everyone, welcome to uh, our next part of our series in the Exodus. Uh, this week what we're doing is continuing on from where we left off last week in the Ten Commandments. Last week, you'll remember, if you joined with us, we were looking at the first four commandments. And when we said those first four commandments, what they did was sum up what Jesus said was the greatest commandment. Uh, and that was to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength. And so the, fir the first four commandments were primarily towards loving God and being devoted to him. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 22. He said this, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to them, as Jesus, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the, fir this is the great and first commandment. And the first four commandments, as he said, summed up this one statement about loving, in one statement about loving God, being devoted to him and him alone. And so that is the vertical element to the commandments. Uh, but then Jesus said in the second part of his statement, in the second part of his answer to that question, he says this, and the second is like it, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets, Matthew 22, 36 to 40. And in saying that the second command is like the first, Jesus is saying that the last six commandments, which are wrapped up in loving our neighbours as ourselves, are an outworking of the first four commandments. To love God the way that we should and be devoted to him the way that we should means that we will love our neighbour as we love ourselves. And so the last six commandments are directed in that horizontal relationships that we have with our neighbour. And so that's what we're going to be looking at today. And again, as we look at this second section of the Ten Commandments, as we look at towards loving our neighbour, uh, it's no coincidence that we do that this week. We know in the past few weeks that we have witnessed these commands being completely disregarded. These commands are to love our neighbour. When Jesus was asked, who is his neighbour? He went on to tell the Samaritan or the parable of the Good Samaritan. And we know the point of the Good Samaritan uh, was to illustrate that even though culturally the Samaritan and the Jew were supposed to hate each other, the Samaritan loved the Jew and looked after him and cared for him and paid for his uh, stay in the inn. And Jesus then said to the Jewish crowd, go and do likewise. And Jesus displays 
in that, the heart of these six commandments that finish off the ten. If we say we love God, we are to love humanity. As I say, this comes in the back of a couple of weeks where we look around our world and we see the opposite of that. We see hatred towards our fellow man. But we're to love our fellow man. Regardless of race, political persuasion, social status, economic status, regardless of everything, the call on those who would proclaim to follow Christ, those who proclaim to follow God, is to love our neighbour. To love all of humanity. Why? One, because God commands it. God tells us here that we are to love our neighbours. Jesus backed that up, as I say in the story of the Good Samaritan, who is your neighbour, and your neighbour is all of humanity. And the second reason that we are to love our neighbour is, is because all of humanity is made in the image of God. They are image bearers, and so they carry an intrinsic value, an intrinsic worth that only comes from being part of his glorious creation and his image bearers. That's why racism, racism and Christianity cannot coexist. That's why sectarianism and Christianity cannot coexist. That's why bigotry and Christianity cannot coexist. And so this call comes to us to love our neighbour. And in the last six commandments, we're going to see very practically how God wants us to do that. In things that he commands us not to do. And things that he commands us to do. And the first of this last six, the fifth, is one of those things that we are to do. It's a positive. And it says this, Honour your father and your mother that you may live long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Exodus 20 verse 12. God commands us here to honour our mother and father. The word honour here means to give weight to. It means to, to give a right place to the authority that, that parents have in the lives of children. That's, what it, that's literally what it means. It means to respect the position that they hold in a child's life. And the opposite of that, of course, is disrespect. The opposite of this command is, uh, when, when God says, honour your father and your mother, the opposite of that is to disrespect the parent. Leviticus 20 will go on to say that the penalty for that sin of disrespecting one's parent can be death. And, so, and in some instances in the Old Testament, that was by stoning. The point of this command is this. We are to respect and honour the God-given position of our parents in our lives and also respect those in positions of authority in our lives. And maybe I'm a little bit old-fashioned when it comes to this, but I still believe that the children should respect and honour their parents. They should. Of course, in the New Testament, when we, when we see this command in the Old Testament to honour your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land that the Lord your God has given you, we see both a command and then we see God's gracious provision in the fact that he, if, you, if we fulfil this command, then he will, he will uh, let us live long in the land. But then we move into the New Testament and we come across a story where disrespect of a parent is perfectly depicted. The story in the New Testament that I'm talking about, obviously, is the prodigal son. And we see in, in the story of the prodigal, the prodigal comes to the father and says, Father, I really want my inheritance now. And, and there would be no greater disrespect than that in the, in, in the times that it was when, when the child would come and say that. Because he, what, he, what he's generally saying is, I wish you were dead and I wish I could have my money now. And so he is blatantly disrespecting his father. Now, what have we just, what have, what have we just heard? What was the penalty for that? The penalty for that was death. The penalty for that, dis that disrespect was stoning to death. 
And you see, when we think about that, when we think about the disrespect that that son showed to the father, and then we think of how the father responds and the grace that is extended by the father, it blows us away. And you see, the father, obviously, in the prodigal son story, is a representation of our father, God. The grace that the father shows is meant to represent the grace that the father shows to us. And you see, the reality is of the fifth commandment, is that you and I break that commandment to our father all the time. We disrespect him. We dishonor him with our lives. We show contempt for him often in the things that we do or the things that we think or the things that we say. And yet our loving Heavenly Father does what? He doesn't have us stoned to death. He shows us grace. He shows us grace. You see, we see in, in the Father's perfect love for us just pure and utter grace. And when we think of this commandment, when we think of this commandment to honour our fathers and our mothers, and, and when we think of our relationships with our children, we are as parents to represent uh, God the Father to them. And so even though they disrespect us sometimes, and sometimes they do, uh, we are to extend grace to them. We're to teach them to respect us. We're to, we're to teach them to honour us. We're to teach them to give people an authority, the right respect and honour that is due to them. But when they feel, as inevitably they will, we show them grace, just as the Father extends grace to us. So this first commandment that we're looking at today, honour your father and your mother, that the, that the Lord your God may uh, give you long in the land. We break that all the time. And God shows us grace. So let us be representatives of our Father to our children in teaching them to respect and honour their parents, but also extending them grace when they fail. The sixth commandment is then this, this series of you shall not, you shall not. Uh, as I said, the first one was a positive uh, Honour your father and your mother. Then there's this series of you shall not. And the first one is you shall not murder. Exodus 20, 13. And the command here is not to murder. And the word Hebrew, and the word in Hebrew specifically means putting to death improperly for selfish reasons rather than with authorization. It means not to put to death in a premeditated or intentional manner. Stuart in his commentary on, the, on this one says, no Israelite acting on his own behalf could decide that he had the right to end someone's life. And in this command we see again God showing us the sanctity of human life that he bestows on it and the value of human life that he bestows on it. So this command uh, begs a couple of questions to say the least. It begs, the que it begs these questions. Is there a right time to kill? What are the modern day implications and applications of this command? And so what I want to do is, is think through these things briefly uh, and let you decide what your position is on them. So let's think about the first question that I, that I, that I stated there. Is there a right time to kill? And as I say, what I want to do is simply lay out the positions and let you think about them and let them you think them through. And in our connect groups this week, I'm sure this will, this will bring up some good discussion. First, what I'll say here is the prohibition is not to murder. It's not to murder. The definition of murder is this. It is to unlawfully kill in a premeditated fashion. So, God, so God's prohibition, prohibition here is, is on killing. It applies to murder. Not to capital punishment. Not to warfare that is justified. Or not to legitimate defence. 
Those are three instances where people give where it is right to kill. Where it is right. Capital punishment, just war theory, and self-defense. Just war theory is when a nation deems it morally right to step in where it is the last resort and they deem it morally right to step in to defend another nation that is being oppressed or another nation that is going to be conquered by, by an oppressor and they step in and, and, and they inevitably in that situation in war, people lose their lives. And then we have capital punishment, which you know, and then there's self-defense. Those are the three times people would say that it is okay to take a life. And that is not considered murder. The second question then is what are the modern day implications for this command and breaking this command? Well, we know uh, very clearly that, uh, that abortion would come under this. Abortion would be the premeditated taking of a life, taking in our own hands to, to, to kill another human. And the second is what we've witnessed in America in recent weeks. The murder of George Floyd, an unarmed man by a police officer. A few weeks before that, the murder of Ahmad Arbery. And what I would say is this, and I know you know this, but I, but I feel as if I need to repeat it. All lives are of equal value because all lives carry and bear the image of the Creator. There's been a lot of debate recently about the hashtag Black Lives Matter. And there's, a, there's, a, there's an organisation that goes along with that. Uh, and that organisation, we need to be very careful that we distinguish when we say Black Lives Matter, what we, what we mean that we're distinguishing it from that organisation because, because there's a lot of things that that organisation may, may do or may agree with that we wouldn't personally agree with. But when we say Black Lives Matter, what, 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 when I say Black Lives Matter, what I mean is that, and I heard this explained somewhat, very well the other day, is that we could say all lives matter and just leave it at that. But the reality is that all lives won't matter until black lives do. And so we need to speak up. We need to defend. And we need to seek justice. Because it's just not right. It's just not right. God says, do not murder. Do not murder. Jesus, of course, in the Sermon on the Mount, went one step further. In Matthew 5, Jesus says this, you have, heard it, you have heard it that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you, that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to counsel. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. In other words, Jesus wants to show us that even in our attitudes and in our thoughts, we break this commandment. The do not murder one is one of those commandments that we think we can get away with because we have not killed someone. But have you been angry with someone? Have you thought wrongly about someone? Jesus says, then you've murdered them in your heart and you're guilty of breaking the law. Again, just a reminder, Jesus is just lovingly reminding us that we break all of the time, all of the time. Sixth commandment, do not murder. As we move on to the seventh then, uh, 
we, we get another, you shall not. And this one is, you shall not commit adultery. Exodus 20, 14. And this one seems pretty straightforward, doesn't it? Uh, it's one of those ones again where you just you just look at it and you be like, I, I understand that, I know what that means. Do not commit adultery. But, again, it goes much further than what we think. The Westminster Shorter Catechism here really helps us out, actually. It says this, The law against adultery also forbids all unchaste thoughts, words, and actions. Indeed, Jesus tells us as much in the Sermon on the Mount. Besides adultery, then the seventh commandment outlaws incest, sexual abuse, homosexuality, bestiality, pornography, and simply lust in general. It is a far-reaching law that we all broke the first time lust was aroused within us. Let me repeat that last line from the Westminster Shorter Catechism, just so that we get the weight of what's being said here. It is a far-reaching law that we all broke the first time lust was aroused in us. And again, this is one of those commands that we can tend to think is someone else's problem. That, that would never be me. I, I am, I'm okay on this one. We look through the 10, we go, okay, I have one God. Get that, that's fine. I'm possibly okay with that one. Don't make any graven image. Well, I might struggle with a bit of idol worship here and there. And then we look through them and we do not murder. God, that nailed that. that that's not me. Do not commit adultery. Fine there. Don't have a problem. But did you hear the statement that came from that shorter catechism? We've all broken it. Let me read to you what James says in James chapter 2. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. You're doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the law but fails in one point has become guilty of it all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak, so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12 says this, Therefore let anyone who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. And so when we think about the act of adultery, and the act of adultery here, as I say, is specific to any sexual transgressions but when we think of that let's not think ourselves above this let's not think ourselves that this could not be me i think the westminster catechism there is very clear that that it shows that all of us when that that issue of lust is aroused in us for the very first time we've broken this commandment so let's not be too quick to judge others. Let's not be too quick to cast doubt on others. Let's love one another well. And we should be very careful, as it says in 1 Corinthians, to think we're standing lest we fall. Do not commit adultery. The eighth commandment, do not steal. Again, this one's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Uh, simply put, this is, uh, not, this is taking anything that does not belong to you. Again, but the implications are much wider and much greater than sometimes we think and it can show itself in many, many different ways. This commandment goes right back to the Garden of Eden. Think about it. God there with Adam and Eve in the Garden, uh, in perfection, says that all of this is yours. Don't touch that. That's the one thing that you are not 
you're not allowed to have. And what do they do? They go and steal what is not theirs. And so ensues the fall. And so ensues the fall. Stealing this, taking what is not ours, is the opposite of gratitude. In a large number of cases, why people steal is because they want something that's not theirs. And the reason they want something that's not theirs is because they are ungrateful for what they already do have. We as followers of Christ are to be satisfied with what God has given us. We're not, as we'll go on to find out in, in later, in, in, the, in the 10th commandment, we're not to look around us and think, oh, I wish I had that, I wish I had that, oh, you know, and, and go after it in such a way as to, as to take it from someone unlawfully. We as followers of Christ are to be good stewards of what God has given us. And we're not to take from others what's not what's not ours. Stealing, of course, takes many different forms. Breaking into a house, taking what's not yours. Shoplifting, taking what's not yours. Forging a check, stealing from your employer. Sometimes it's, it's theft by deception, uh, a mail order company that doesn't do what they say they're gonna do. An employer, uh, claiming deductions for workers that don't exist. Companies offering special discounts or saying things that are on sale when they're not on sale at all. You know, these things are all theft. And then some stealing is thought to be more respectable or more savvy than others. Or shrewd not declaring all your income on your tax returns, lying about a student loan application, creative accounting, things like fake clothing, fake goods. All those things are theft, they're stealing. It's as simple as that. And again, this is one that we think Oh, others are prone to do. I haven't robbed a bank. I haven't went into the milestone and shoplifted. I haven't done those things, so therefore I, I'm, I don't steal. I'm not, a, I'm not a thief. But have you fudged the tax returns? Have you stolen from your employer? Have you taken stolen time from your employer that you should be working? All of those things are theft. And therefore, when we think about this command not to steal, we, we, we need to think much wider and, 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 and go into more depth in our own hearts and, and, and search ourselves to see where we're guilty. Because there's a theme emerging. I don't know if you've spotted it, but the theme is this. We break all the commandments. All of them. There is not one that we keep completely, not one. Do not steal, do not take what is not yours. The ninth commandment then, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, Exodus twenty sixteen. To bear false witness is, is against others, is to lie about them. You see the context here is specific. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. This is to lie about other people. The Hebrew word translated neighbor in this commandment can mean associate, brother, companion, fellow, friend, husband, lover, neighbor, whatever it may be. In other words, the Israelites were commanded to be truthful in all things and especially when they were speaking about their brothers and sisters. Or about anyone else. You see the reason for God prohibiting lying and testifying falsely against one's neighbour are threefold. First of all, God's people are to reflect God's character. The Lord is truthful. He cannot lie. 
Numbers 23 says, God is not man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and then not fulfill? The people who were called by God's name and who, who represented him in the heathen world were expected to reflect God's character accurately. And part of that, part of that accuracy is not telling lies, not lying about each other. God doesn't tell lies about us. He says that we're both sinful and loved. He says that we're both, uh, outside of Christ, we're, we're heading for judgment. But inside of Christ, we are children of the living God. He tells us the truth. He tells us about who we are. He doesn't lie to us or about us. And we're not to lie about one another either. As we listen to this as the church, and I'm speaking specifically to Cornerstone, uh, when I say this, please, please, please consider this commandment. Do not lie about each other. Lies might mean just a wee embellishment on the truth. Lies also include a half-truth where you tell a, a part of a story but don't finish the story because the story, the rest of the story might make actually someone look better than what you want them to look. Don't lie about each other. Tell the truth. Tell the truth. The tenth commandment. Do not covet. And the key to understanding this commandment uh, is that there are two different two different Hebrew words used uh, concerning this word coveting. But both mean the same thing. They both mean to lust after or long for with great desire. And, and since these commandments are given as you shall not. The desire in this case is for something that is not the property of, your, of you. You don't own it. And so you are lusting or desiring after something that is not yours. In, in this commandment, the Israelites are, are, are told not to look at your neighbor's possessions and lust after them and, and desire them. His land, ox, donkey, uh, or the people in his life. His wife, his servants, both male and female. The Israelites were not to desire what was not theirs. You see, whereas several of the commandments prohibit certain actions such as murder or theft, this is one that goes to the heart. Those are actions. Don't steal. Don't take from someone. I know they come out of the heart, but they're actions. Don't murder. So that's, don't kill. That's an action. This one, this covetousness, covetousness comes from within us. As James says in 1, James 1.15, it tells us that, that sin originates from the inner person. And this sin of covetousness comes from within us. And it's a forerunner. It's, a, it's, a, it's the thing that leads to all the other things that we've just talked about. Like murder and stealing and, and adultery. And all, all, all of those things come out of this coveting. Jesus again spoke about this, reiterated this. Uh, on the Sermon on the Mount when he said that lust in the heart is every bit as sinful as committing adultery. He says when you look at someone in a lustful manner, you've committed adultery in your heart. That, that longing, that desire, that covetedness that he's talking about here. You see this covetedness, this envy goes well beyond uh, a longing look at your neighbor's car or your their your neighbor's house or whatever it may be coveting goes further than that coveting goes to a place where you so desire something of someone else's that you actually end up resenting them because they have it They can turn, it can turn into resentment towards God because God has not been as good to you as he has been to your neighbour. And again, the spirit of ungratefulness comes up within us. 
we think that God has not provided for us in the way that he should. And so we're ungrateful and so we covet. We look around us and we desire and we lust after things that are not ours. You see, God wants us to rest. And that's a crazy thought in today's world, but it's true. God wants us to rest and he wants us to rest in his sovereignty and he wants us to rest in what he has given us. We are not constantly to be looking around for what the next thing is or for what we haven't got and what we can't have. All that does is create restlessness. Constant looking, wanting, desiring, striving. When he's over here all the time saying, rest in me, rest in me. Come to me, all you who are weak and are heavy laden, and I will what? Give you rest. And so as we've walked through the first four commandments, and I know this has been a bit of a whistle-stop tour through the Ten Commandments, but as we've walked through the first four, we see very clearly that they are to do with our vertical relationship with the Lord. How we're to, to trust that there is one true God. How we're to have no other gods before him. How we're not to make for ourselves any graven images of anything that we would worship. We love the Lord and the Lord alone. And then as we move into the final six, we see that that love for God produces a love for others and our respect for others, and an honouring of others. And my hope for myself, as and my hope is for you as we've walked through these Ten Commandments, is what Paul says in Romans 7. Listen to this. What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would have not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. My hope again is that the scriptures have revealed to us our sinful nature. We should be so thankful for the word of God that, that God doesn't lie to us. And that he's honest with us. And he shows us who we are. And Paul talks elsewhere about that being the very purpose of the law. It is to reveal sin to us. The law in itself has no power to save. Paul says. It can't save us but it shows us how sinful we are. I, I hope that as we've went through the ten commandments. And you've, you've ticked them off. You've been like one. Have no other gods before me. Oops. Fail. Oh, don't worship idols. Oops, fail. As we've progressed through the 10, you will have, you'll have realized, as I realized again, that I fail in every single one of them. Every one of them. There's not one that I, that I nail. There's not one that I nail on a, on a daily basis. So what does that do? Does that drive us to despair? Or does it drive us to look beyond ourselves for our salvation? I hope it's the second. I hope it doesn't drive us to despair. I hope it drives us towards Jesus. You see, the reality is he came and what he said was not one dot or tittle will will, of the law would pass away until he had fulfilled it all perfectly. And so he did in his life. Jesus fulfilled the Ten Commandments and every other commandment perfectly in our place. And so I don't know about you, but when I think about the 10 and when I think about the way that I feel and the way that I fall and I think then of my sinfulness and I think about bringing that towards a holy God and we know already from the book of Exodus that he cannot stand sin in his presence. What are we to do? We are to run to Jesus. We're to run to Jesus and we are to stand behind him. And be unified with him as the Father looks at us and says, We are forgiven. That's the gospel. The good news of the gospel is that we 
No, we can't keep the Ten Commandments. And yet, we can be forgiven and we can enter into the presence of a holy God because of Jesus. That's the good news of the gospel. The good news of the gospel is not that we get to try to be really, really good and keep these Ten Commandments. That's not good news at all. Because we know we fail. The good news of the gospel is that one came called Jesus, who stands in our place, who fulfilled them perfectly, made sacrifice for our sins, went to the cross, died, rose again, sits at the right hand of the Father and intercedes for us right now, is praying for us right now. And because of all of that, the Father pronounces forgiveness on us. That's the gospel. And so, don't despair. Don't run to despair, run to Jesus. And I hope you'll be encouraged by seeing him even more beautifully through these commandments because of what he has done for us. It's in his name. Amen.